Aloha and welcome. My name is Judge Jim Gray and welcome to our show, Becoming America. In the next 16 weeks and plus today, we're going to be talking about the heritage that we all have as Americans. We're going to talk about the Constitution, the greatest document in my mind ever written by the hand of man. And we're going to talk about the delegates, the times, the convention. The convention indeed, the three of us are sitting in Independence Hall right now, probably as we will learn the most historic place in the United States of America for all kinds of reasons. So we're going to be doing this. It's going to be exciting. We're going to have fun. Uh, we're here to in effect talk with our, my colleagues. I'm proud to be identified with them. Dr. Joellen Chatham, who we call the professor and the honorable Bijan Kean, who we call the American. And we're going to discuss the reasons behind that in just a few minutes. But we want our time to be educational. We want it to be historic. And we want it, of course, to be fun. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, I am Judge Jim Gray. I was in the Peace Corps. And I say that because I care about people. I was a federal prosecutor. I was a defense attorney in the Navy and then a judge in Orange County, California for 25 years. I retired my goodness, uh, 11 and a half years ago, I'm doing private judging now. I tell people that I became a judge when I was 12 years old. That's why I'm still so young and we don't allow any questioning in that area at all. You accept that, we'll get along fine. We have our colleague, Dr. Joellen Chatham, who is a, a professor at Concordia University. The more you know her, the more you will be like I am, inspired by this lady. But instead, Joellen, say your welcomes and talk a little bit about yourself. I know you don't like to do that, give it a try. Well, thanks, Judge. Uh, and in fact, I'm the director of the Center for Public Policy, Citizenship, and Ethics at Concordia University, Irvine. And our purpose is to promote ethics in government, uh, responsible citizenship, and of course, understanding our country's heritage. And uh, my whole background, uh, educationally and otherwise, has been in the political sphere, whether I was working for Southern California Edison, uh, or teaching at the university um, many, many years ago for a number of years, um, I've always been concerned that America understands and appreciates her heritage. And there was a study uh, recently done by the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. They surveyed over 50,000 people in all 50 states and using the questions that are on the immigrant test that every immigrant must pass before they're granted citizenship, they surveyed people. Sadly, and this was just last year, sadly, only one state could a majority of the people that were surveyed pass that test. That state was Vermont. California came in 31st. So the American people do not have a good understanding of their own constitution. And immigrants actually have a better understanding because at least they have to pass that test. So our goal here and my personal goal is to, in an entertaining and enlightening way, help people understand the blessings that we have under this constitution and how it should extend to all. See, we're off to that good start. I, honestly, sometimes as a judge, I get to swear people into various offices like with the Bar Association and you swear to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. Then I tell them to keep their hands up and swear that they'll read it because most people just are not aware of that. But, but that's why we're doing this. It's going to be fun. It'll be educational. And now we have our American. Now, we all know that I was born blessed to be born in the United States. I was an American automatically, so is Dr. Joellen. But uh, Bijan came from Iran. He chose to come to America. And this man, talk about a success story, has twice been confirmed by the United States Senate. Uh, that's two times more than I have, by the way. Has served three presidents from both political parties and, and actually reported directly to two of them, the 2009 recipient of the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, which is an award also given to seven of our presidents. I could go on and on about Bijan, the American, but Bijan, give us your welcome and, and uh, your introduction. Judge Gray, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful and very kind and humbling introduction of me. You know, uh, why do you call me the American? Uh, I can understand that. 41 years ago, I arrived here from England. I was born in Iran and that year, maybe a few months earlier, 52 American hostages were taken by a government that had come to power in Iran through a revolution. And I was, uh, I was here uh, alone, didn't know anyone, didn't have any friends or any networks or any background. I didn't even know exactly where I was. I arrived in Orange County, California. 
with $30 in my pocket and uh, Judge Gray and Joe Ellen, um, if you were to take a bet as to what's gonna happen to this young man, just arrived from England, fast forward 30 years and like you said, and I'm very humbled by it, uh, Judge Gray, I got to be uh, serving three presidents of the United States in various capacities. I'm very honored by that. But you know, I shouldn't sound like I'm bragging about what I have done because what I have done is irrelevant. It's America. This is the American miracle that has uh, taken me from that you know, young man from England, born in Iran and uh, with not very much uh, money or any other means. Uh, it's about America, the miracle of America. And people tell me, well, America has problems. And what I tell them is America is a perfect idea. And the United States is work in progress. We're constantly improving. So uh, I'm just delighted to be here talking about the Constitution. The Constitution that really I feel sometimes it was written for me, for my family, for all the immigrants, Judge Gray, that you uh, told us you swore them in sometimes and you swore people into high offices all reciting the Constitution and the allegiance that we all have to this greatest document ever written in human history. So delighted to be here with you and our friends who are kind enough to come and watch what we're talking about. Oh, Bijan, I, I, I have to interrupt and tell a little story about Bijan. Uh, Jim, you mentioned the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. I was in New York City with Bijan and his wife when Bijan received that honor. And we were having dinner in a little restaurant. And uh, Bijan looked at me and he said, uh, let me tell you about the other woman in my life. <laughs> I was a little bit taken aback because his beautiful wife, Gisu, was sitting right next to him. And I said, the other woman in your life? And he pointed off in the distance and he says, yes, that lady in the harbor. And he was talking about the Statue of Liberty, of course. And that was, that was quite, a, quite a moving moment. Um, should we talk a little bit about this place we're sitting in? Um, That's a true story. That That's a true story, Joe. Okay. I know it is. It's good to have another woman, huh, Joanne? And she is, she is guiding us all, Bijan, uh, and, and bless us. Uh, and bless her for that. But but yes, we have used the word here several times, Joellen, and you told me something I'd never heard before a little while ago. You can learn a great deal from Joellen Chatham, but but tell us a little bit. This is the old state house in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It's where the Constitutional Convention was held, of course, and the Declaration of Independence was signed, but there's a great deal more than that to it. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, because it's fascinating, Joellen. Where are we? This building was built in 1732. It took us a few years to build it. Um, but this very room that we are virtually sitting in uh, is where the Continental Congress officially appointed George Washington as Chief of Staff of the Continental Army. This is where the Articles of Confederation were written. This is where the Declaration of Independence was written. I mean, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and Benjamin Franklin, they were all sitting in this room. Um, later on, the Constitutional Convention was held here, as you mentioned, Jim. And what is, I think, one of the most interesting stories is that when President Lincoln was on his way to Washington, D.C. to be sworn in, the Lincoln Special, as they called the train, came through Philadelphia. And he came into this very room. And as he stood here, he said, I would rather be assassinated on this spot than ever to divert from the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. Well, four years later, he was back in this room, but he had been assassinated. Um, when the train was taking him from Washington, D.C., back to Springfield, Illinois, for his burial, uh, they stopped here, and he lay in state in this room for two days. And as the hearse came down the street from the train station to the State House, 85,000 people lined the streets, and the two days he lay and stayed here, 300,000 people walked by um, to view uh, their president, and many of them waited in line for five hours. Um, what we don't see in this room is, this is a small room, this is on the bottom floor of the State House. This is where the Pennsylvania State Legislature met, but during the Constitutional Convention, 
And during the Second Continental Congress, they moved upstairs so that our founders could meet here. Um, there's a small chair right here. This is where George Washington sat as he conducted the Constitutional Convention. There's a wonderful story about this chair, but we'll save that for another day. Behind us is a small gallery, which is separated just by a simple small railing. And uh, the Pennsylvania legislature held its meetings in open public so often the public stood behind and can watch the, uh, the proceedings. They were not allowed to watch the proceedings of the convention, um, but this room is historic. It really is truly the birthplace of America. Well, and indeed so. So we're sharing. We're going to talk in the 16 sessions to come of what it was. Candidly, this show emanated from my musical. I wrote it with two colleagues, uh, Steve Lawless, who writes songs, children's songs, and also some really fun, caring songs. And then a, uh, Joel Henry Stein, who's a professional musician, uh, he uh, was the uh, uh, one that put it all together. And it was kind of my idea because there's so many, like, like Joe Allen and Bijan were saying, that there's so much in our history. And I thought, well, we have the musical 1776, so that's Declaration of Independence time, but we really don't have anything with regard to our Constitutional Convention. So I gathered some thoughts together and we have uh, 17 songs. Uh, there's, a, there's an overture, we're about to hear it. Go. We're going to base this show, Becoming America, America is a perfect idea, like Bijan said. The United States of America is a work in progress. That's the title of our show. I think it says it all. And so we're going to base each session on one song. And so the next one will be, well, you can't get there from here, you know, that sort of thing, with the delegates trying to get to get to Philadelphia in May of 1787. And we go through and hold the, the, the uh, uh, delegates accountable because there are a lot of people we left behind, certainly slaves, certainly Native Americans, women, etc. And so we will go through all of these things, trace our history, and at the end we will kind of have a musical summary bringing us up to date of various things that we've been doing. So it's just going to be fun. We're going to share with you. Uh, we appreciate your thoughts. You can, you can contact us as well. I have a website, judgejimgray.com, and you can contact me and us through there. So come and join us and listen to the Overture Convention, The Birth of America. And you certainly might want to turn up your volume because there's a lot of history in those words and you can ponder them just like we will. So let's give that a listen as we get into the Overture of Convention, The Birth of America for Becoming America. Out of the old world, and far from the clutches of the tyrant George the Third, came the churning and yearning for freedom. It is the drumbeat we all heard. We've come to Philadelphia to represent our brothers in this great land. To peace together, a nation strong and long, that strong state shall stand. Convention is where we blend and sow ideals to start anew. Convention is here and how we work, this eternal dream make true. With the natural rights from the great John Locke And wisdom from Greece and Rome And with guidance from our almighty God We shall bring this freedom home So, Secretary, read the roll And read it north to south To see if we have a quorum here Please, delegates, give mouth. New Hampshire, we, we too are here. Massachusetts, Massachusetts, I. Rhode Island, we are here just to observe. Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey here. Yes, here fully to comply. A host from Pennsylvania, how many do you be? We count us up as eight. Delaware and Maryland, five from each, but we fear that some still be late. And now from down there in the south, Virginia, 
We are a full seven, said. Carolinas and our Georgia friends. Five, five, and four. Our states have lent a quorum as we launch this noble task with pure and willing heart. A great drama is about to begin, and so with that now we start. Out of the old world and far from the clutches of the tyrant George the Third. Came the churning and yearning for freedom. It is the drum beat we all heard. We've come to Philadelphia to represent our brothers in this great land. To peace together, a nation strong and long that strong state shall stand. A convention is where we blend and so ideas to start anew. Convention is here and how we work, this eternal dream make true. With the natural rights from the great John Locke And wisdom from Greece and Rome And with guidance from our almighty God We shall bring this freedom home Convention Jim, that is so great. That music is is fun, uh, but it's also historical. Now, you wrote the lyrics to most of these words. So when you talk about George, um, uh, George the Third, the tyrant, John Locke, the philosophers of ancient Greece and Rome, there's a lot packed into that song. What were you trying to say? There's a lock packed into that song. Is that what you said? <laughs> no, there's a lot packed in the song, <laughs> including a lock, John Locke. You know, this the, the delegates knew this. They were amazingly educated. And of course, many of them were planters and had some time on their hands. They weren't, weren't working out in the field. Uh, many of them were college educated, which is very rare in that time. Uh, most of them were pretty young. That uh, Benjamin Franklin was 81, but but everyone else was, was a great deal younger. But they knew this was an experiment that had really never happened before. It was an experiment in democracy. They were aware of ancient Greece, ancient Rome, the problems that they had as a result of it. And so they then went into Locke, uh, Hobbes. They, they were aware of these various things. They also had been the colonies from the New World. Hey, there was a pretty long ocean between George III and these separate 13 colonies, which really saw themselves as 13 separate states. And then they started to get annoyed that, uh, well, this tyrant, as they called him, and he pretty much was, uh, was dictating what they would do with regard to trade. Oh, America has to first trade with England so that they get the benefits and we don't so much. And then they started getting taxed and the old taxation without representation came to fore uh, and uh, they just, they, they got upset with it. They then got together when they saw this happening. Thomas Jefferson, of course, led it, but uh, the, the Declaration of Independence, they had natural rights as Englishmen as Englishmen. And so we, we got into these sorts of things. They were facing problems, though. Uh, it was not easy. And we'll go through a lot of those problems and a lot of those debates. But this is the time for me to say that, yes, I did conduct a lot of history with regard to these whole things. Uh, and I found out from basically three sources, Joellen and, and Bijan. Uh, the first was Miracle at Philadelphia, the story of the Constitutional Convention made September of 1787. And that was by Catherine Drinker Bowen with a forward by, by the way, Chief Justice Berger. And then the second book was Constitutional Journal, a, a correspondence report from the convention of 1787, by the way, again, with the forward from Chief Justice Warren Berger, and then kind of books on tape. It's called the America's Founding Fathers. I strongly recommend it. It was done by the great courses and uh, in combination with Smithsonian Institute. Talk about some really good, good players there. But uh, they did have some problems. One thing, and I know I'm going on a bit because it, it really is, it captured me. I found out that yes, the 55 delegates bickered, argued, debated about virtually everything. The thing each of the 55 delegates believed was the most important function of government was protecting our liberties from the encroachment of government, protecting our liberties from the encroachment of government. Number two thing important was keeping us safe. And boy, that sure got my attention. And I think we've strayed away from that. But, but there were lots of problems, Bijan, 
uh, what, what did they do to grapple with those various problems uh, in the Constitutional Convention? What were they facing? Well, you know, it would be a good question to answer. Why, why did they come to the convention? What was the purpose for that? Uh, well, the colonies put together very quickly a document that they called the Articles of Confederation. This Articles of Confederation was not meant to really regulate anything other than create some kind of a league of friendship that they agreed they're going to work together. But there were serious problems. Even, even during the war, there were problems that got even worse. And they, they began to understand that this Articles of Confederation is not going to serve the purpose of really uniting the colonies. They had no power to tax. The Congress, the Continental Congress, had no power to tax. It relied on donations from states. It had no powers to regulate interstate commerce. It had no ability to change anything because to change anything, it required all 13 to agree. And this was, this was an impossibility. This was, this was not an easy thing to do. So uh, they decided they, it was time for them to come together to the convention to amend, and this is really important because we'll talk more about this, the purpose of the convention was to amend the articles and expand, amend and expand the Articles of Confederation. But we'll talk about it. Did they do that or something else happened? Yes. Well, then there's, the issue, there's the issue of urgency. Um, why all of a sudden it seems did this occur? Because they knew as far back as the Revolutionary War that the Articles of Confederation were not working. Um, President Washington, uh, I said General Washington during the war had as much trouble fighting the Continental Congress as he did fighting the British because he relied on the Congress for supplies, for militia, for men. And he constantly had to um, beg the states to do this because the Continental Congress could not tax. They couldn't raise an army. They couldn't do the things that Bijan, you just said. Um, so they knew from the outset that they weren't working, but they had to stay together during the war. So the war ended. And then they came up with the problems, Bijan, that you mentioned about problems with trade and so on. But as things went on, it got worse. Um, number one, foreign nations didn't want to trade with us because they didn't know who us was. Were we one nation? Were we 13 independent states? So they didn't want to trade with us. They didn't want to make treaties with us. The Articles of Confederation prohibited states from making treaties with other nations, but some states started to do it anyway. Then there was the issue of the Western lands. We had Spain in the South, we had France and England on the Western lands. Um, there were issues about navigation rights on the Mississippi, which were extremely important for international trade. So things were really boiling up. And then in Massachusetts, Shays Rebellion, these were military veterans who had been promised land. They had been promised of all things, pay for their service in the war. The Continental Congress was broke. They didn't have the money. So a group of veterans, a very large group of veterans, shut down the courthouse in several places in Massachusetts so that the creditors couldn't come after them. Uh, and it ended up almost, it was somewhat violent near the end, but was this the first of many? So finally, they said, you know, we have got to do something. They called for the convention uh, in May of 1787 in Philadelphia. Yes, and something has to be done. Uh, they all understood that, that they were, they were just, the articles weren't working. So, okay, we will, we will enlarge them. Well, or we're, are we going to overthrow the government? By the way, that's one of the songs that we're going to be addressing as we, as we come. Did they really overthrow the government? Because the articles took all 13 states to be able to amend them, but to, to ratify the constitution only took nine. So this, in fact, it was seven, I believe. But what was the- nine. You were right, it was nine. Nine, okay. Uh, just like, at any rate, yes. But we take it for granted. Oh, three branches of government, well, unless you're taking the naturalization test. But, but that wasn't at all understood. You know, we're going to have a president or, well, are we? Are we going to have a group of people, a council to do the executive? Those sorts of things. Are we going to have a strong, energetic, unified federal government? 
in other words, basically the Hamiltonians, or we're going to reserve most of the power for the state. That's the Jefferson. So we have this uh, My Country Needs Me song that we'll talk about soon, where you have Hamilton saying, my country needs me, we need to be a strong government, and Jefferson saying, my country needs me, we're going to be individual states. That's all part of it. So do we want a monarch? In fact, there is actually some talk, some rumors, uh, maybe it was on the internet at the time. Well, I guess they didn't have the internet then, but, but we're going to have a King George. We're going to have King George Washington or even George III's what, son come over and be king. Was there anything to that, Joellen? No, there, there really wasn't. Right after the Revolutionary War, there were a group primarily of military leaders who thought we should have a king and it should be George Washington so we would have our own George, um, George I. Uh, Washington put that uh, to bed very quickly. He had no interest in this uh, and really neither did anybody else. But during the convention itself, an article appeared in a Connecticut newspaper um, claiming that there were individuals who were approaching the second son of George III to invite him to the United States to become our first king. Now, that article in the Connecticut paper showed up in a few other papers, but very quickly, uh, members of the Constitutional Convention inserted a quick response in those newspapers and said, we never once thought of a monarch, and they didn't. Uh, when you read the debates of the convention by Madison and other members kept notes, there's never a mention of a monarch. This was a rumor probably started to encourage the Constitutional Convention to support an energetic executive, but never a monarch. George Washington didn't want to really even uh, go to the convention, as I understand it. He wanted to retire, and then he didn't want to be president either, uh, and didn't want to go into his second term either. So there's a I lot think, of human history here. Well, he had to be convinced. Um, the two people who did the most to convince Washington to attend were General Knox and James Madison. Um, one, he was concerned about his reputation. If this was going to fall apart, he didn't want to be involved with it. He didn't know if it was going to succeed. In fact, he had very negative views about it succeeding. Washington did not want to attend, but they appealed really to his patriotism that we need you. If you were there, along with Benjamin Franklin, the two most revered Americans, not only here, but in Europe, if you are there, this can take place. If you're not there, it was just another meeting. So you're right, Jim, he, he didn't want to be there. But and then while he was there, he hardly ever said a word, but his presence made a huge difference. It, it wouldn't have happened without him, but in many ways, Joe Ellen, yes, George Washington was the father of our country and, and, and bless him forever, but James Madison was the one kind of behind the throne orchestrating things and the rest. Of course, he finally released his notes in 1820. A lot of people felt that he kind of uh, modified them a bit to uh, show he was even more involved, but, but this was going on. Bijan, we had 13 separate companies, separate countries back then. Uh, each one saw itself independent. Uh, what, what did you view as the status of those colonies in July of, 19, of 1776 when we were breaking away from Britain, as well as the summer of 1787? Well, you know, having lived and witnessed tyrannies, I can relate to their feelings. They didn't want to have a true federalism system in place where power was shared equally or distributed in a way that the, you know, the federal government, there was no really federal government, there was no uh, executive or judicial branch, it was just the Congress and only the legislative branch and they couldn't make any decisions. Uh, they designed it that way. They didn't want to be uh, faced with a very powerful federal government because they just freed themselves from the tyranny of George III. They didn't want to have the continuation of a power over them that would tax them, but not give them the ability to participate in decisions and so forth. So taxation without legislation and uh, without representation. Uh, so way, let, let me say, Bijan, I think taxation with representation isn't all that wonderful either sometimes. <laughs> but you know, Jim, Jim's, question, Jim's question is really important one because we were not the United States 
we were states that were united for a purpose, uh, a temporary purpose at that. I mean, if you lived in Virginia or Georgia or South Carolina, it was a whole different life. The economy was different. They actually spoke with different dialects. Um, their attitudes toward freedom of religion and freedom of press was different. In fact, many of the founders referred to their state as my country. And um, it wasn't until the constitution really brought them together. But when you read Madison's notes and others, they were all afraid that Massachusetts was gonna do things that benefited Massachusetts that would hurt South Carolina. That whole business of um, division was, was very prominent throughout the convention. They had to overcome that. Well, I can tell you that we all know that the winners write history. And so of course they just expanded it into what it logically should have been or something. But yes, Bijan, they did overthrow peacefully the, Const the uh, uh, United States of America or the, under the Articles of Confederation. But did it, was it really a conspiracy, Joe Ellen, because they did make provisions for it to be ratified, not by the legislatures of each state, they were too smart for that, but to have their own constitutional conventions. But they, they sent delegates. Uh, who were who the delegates? How did they get chosen? Uh, uh, how did these people uh, wander in? There weren't many women there, but uh, uh, we understand that, and we'll talk about that as we progress. But how are the delegates chosen? Well, the delegates were chosen by each state legislature. Um, in fact, several states, including Pennsylvania, chose their delegates even before the Congress of the Articles Confederation passed a resolution to even hold the convention. So some of them were really ahead of, of, the, of the Congress. But the way it worked was very simple. Once Congress said, let's call a convention, every state legislature passed a resolution saying yes, and most of them used very similar words, the words that Bijan used, that we are to amend and enlarge the Articles of Confederation to meet the needs of the individual states. So each state legislature chose the delegates. Some states had three delegates, some states like Pennsylvania had eight, but at that convention, each state only had one vote. Interestingly enough, Rhode Island chose not to come their legislature literally passed a resolution saying, we will not participate. And they never did participate. Uh, New York only participated halfway, had three delegates. Two of them were under the thumb of Governor Clinton, who was opposed to any changes in the Articles of Confederation. And halfway through the convention, they went home. And Alexander Hamilton, the third delegate, was there off and on. But in the end, he signed, but he couldn't sign for New York because they didn't have a majority of, of delegates there. So um, that's, that's how they were chosen. Let, let's talk a little more about Rhode Island because there were problems back there. And as I understand it in my history, and, and you're more schooled on this than I am, Joe Ellen, but uh, there were a lot of problems with regard to states printing currency. And of course there was inflation and the rest, but the people that were running Rhode Island at the time were making a lot of money because of its state's currency. So they didn't want to change it to the degree that even George Washington, I think was calling them rogue Island. Mm -hmm. uh, is, there, is there much to that story? Absolutely. Um, one of the big issues facing the country was paper money and the value of paper money and states printing their own paper money. That was a Major problem in Rhode Island, as you say, Rhode Island said, we're not participating. Well, George Washington, once they formed the government, asked uh, for Alexander Hamilton uh, what he would like, what part he would like to play in government. And Hamilton said, well, do you want me, Mr. Washington, to be Secretary of State or Secretary of the Treasury? And the issue was so important that he nominated and confirmed uh, Alexander Hamilton to be Secretary of the Treasury so we could address those issues. Uh, exactly. money, money matters then and money matters now, Bijan. <laughs> it sure does. It sure does. Now, who was it that said, I smell a rat because of the issue of, you know, the question about the amending and enlarging or changing the whole document? Who was it that says, I smell a rat? Yeah, um, you're right, Bijan. It was actually uh, uh, Patrick Henry, who was obviously very well known but he was selected as a delegate, did not attend because like you say, I smell a rat. Namely, no, nah, they're not gonna enlarge and expand, uh, amend and, and enlarge. They're going to change the government. But so there were many important people there. Benjamin Franklin, like we said, George Washington, it would not have happened without him. 
James Madison, Governor Morris, et cetera, but who wasn't there? And one, of course, like you said, cogently was Patrick Henry, but Thomas Jefferson wasn't there. I mean, my goodness, founder and the rest, where was he? Well, he was our, our minister, our ambassador to France at the time. He was in Paris, although we still have him come on and are on, on the side for convention, we'll get to that. John Adams, my goodness sakes, I mean, he wrote, helped write the constitution of the state of Massachusetts. A lot of that was used for this constitution, but no, he was our minister to Great Britain, so he was gone. And uh, Thomas Paine as well had left for, uh, for affairs in France. Uh, Paul Revere, uh, spreading the word, no, he was nowhere in sight. So there was a lot of people that, that were really not very well known, but uh, Joe Ellen, we have the Committee of Style. Uh, we talked about Rhode Island, but uh, when it came to it, came down to it, oh, they had lots of committees during the Constitutional Convention. One of them was Committee of Style. Governor Morris is not particularly well known, and it's not governor as such. He wasn't the governor of a state, but he has had that first name. Where did he fit into all of this and his committees? Well, Governor Morris was a very important founder. Um, he probably did more than any single individual to actually writing the constitution. James Madison had a series of resolutions that were offered by Edmund Randolph, but after the delegates spent several months passing resolution after resolution after resolution, it all had to be brought together. And it was brought together by the committee of detail at first, and then they made changes in that. And finally near the end, it, all of these ideas and thoughts and motions that had been voted on and approved had to be put in the form of a document. And there was a committee, the Committee of Style, which Governor Morris uh, chaired. He was from Pennsylvania. And one of the most important things he did, other than um, compact all of these things into the seven articles that now comprise um, the Constitution, he changed the preamble because the preamble that they had been given before to consider said, we the people of the United States of New Hampshire, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and on down the line, he changed that. And he said, we the people of the United States. Didn't list the states. It's a whole different thing because he was referring to the people of a united entity, not the people of 13 individual states. And then he also added purpose such as to uh, uh, secure the domestic tranquility, secure the general welfare. welfare. Governor Morris was very important, but there are a lot of other individuals there who were important as well. Um, Bijan was talking about overthrowing the government, which is a topic we should probably get back to. Um, during the convention, one of the reasons the two delegates from New York left is they said, you're exceeding your powers. You're not amending, you're talking about a whole new document. Other members complained the same way, but they chose to stay. Um, but James Wilson, brilliant. He was a Scot immigrant, um, this deep Scotch burr. He was a brilliant lawyer, uh, wore these spectacles. And at one point he said, we were invited here to propose anything, but we don't decide anything. So he felt very comfortable not uh, limiting himself. He said, all we're doing is proposing other people will decide. That was an important statement. Well, that's certainly true enough. And, and it's important to delve into these delegates because they were experienced, they were caring, uh, and they certainly diversified. My goodness. I mean, they didn't have any duels there, but uh, they certainly fought and bickered with each other. We're going to get into all of these various things. So in effect, we did have a proposal in the Constitution eventually to have it amended. Uh, Article 5 of the Constitution, there were two ways to propose amendments. Uh, one was to the, the Constitution to have two-thirds of both houses, as I understand it, propose amendments. And so far, we've had 27 amendments come about. But uh, the other words, we've had more than like a thousand amendments, and, which can all overthrow the government, but peacefully. In fact, it was Thomas Jefferson, as I heard it, who said, once he read about the Constitution, which in many ways he did not favor, he said, we're going to need a bloody revolution every generation to keep the vested interests at bay. Well, now, fortunately, the Constitution makes the revolution not have to be bloody, but how long has it been since we've had that revolution? 
probably since the Republicans took over from the Whigs in the early or the late 1850s with Abraham Lincoln. But uh, it, it, we need to assess and look at all the powerful public interest or excuse me, private interests that we have going on now. So there was that way. And then there was also the way that it could be amended, not by convention, but by by uh, an amendment of the states. Uh, has that been utilized uh, very often, Joellen? Well, a, a couple of points um, I'd like to make on that, Jim. One is we did have another bloody revolution. It's called the Civil War. And one gentleman has called the Civil War the last battle of the revolution. Um, and of course, we all know what the Civil War was for. It was to keep the Union together and also to free the slaves. And as a result, the Constitution was amended three times, the Civil War amendments. Uh, as you said, there are two ways to propose amendments and two ways to ratify. The two ways to propose amendments are for Congress by two thirds of vote to propose an amendment and then three fourths of the states can ratify it. You can also call a convention for the purpose of uh, proposing amendments, which is what the convention of 1787 was. And then you can hold state conventions to ratify or not ratify. That second process has not been used, and I personally don't believe it should. I think our process for ratifying amendments to the Constitution has worked well. And as Bijan said earlier, America is a perfect ideal, but the United States is a work in progress. I see that work in progress. As one of your songs says later, Jim, about women not being included, African Americans or slaves not being included, and others. Well, look at what we've done. We've expanded the right to vote through to women, to the former slaves, to younger people. The, the Constitution has helped us through the amendment process become a better America and aspire to those uh, statements that are in the Declaration of Independence about equality and freedom. And we're still improving every day. We're still every improving. Every day. More I perfect my union. I doff my cap to both of you. You are the ones that... that coined this phrase that we're, we pirate now, we're going to use for our, our show here, becoming America. That's what we're doing. We're not perfect. We weren't, our founders weren't perfect. We're not perfect, but we're striving for perfection. America is a perfect idea. It is that city on a hill that people aspire to. We don't want to lower ourselves to the standards, which other people want us to, oh, they're no better than anyone else. Yes, we are. But then uh, United States of America, like you said, Bijan, like you said, Dr. Joe Ellen. Work in progress. In progress, that's exactly right. So, so here we go. Please join us in the upcoming 16 sessions or otherwise they're after on demand as well. You can, can always hear that. By the way, that's my dog in the background. When I say something inspirational, she usually agrees with me. Not always, <laughs> but join us on YouTube and more. Uh, particularly in the world today, we're looking at our country in different ways and we're showing our patriotism, we're showing our background. I'm proud of our country. I'm proud of who we have become and I'm proud of who we are going to become still in the future. So Bijan, thank you for being with us as well and, and your inspiration, your, your thoughts as we go into uh, the end of our overture. Well, you know, I uh, remember the last time I was in the room that's right behind us and uh, you know, made made me uh, made me think the story that uh, Joe you shared with us about Abraham Lincoln. I never think about this room the same way after hearing that story, and I didn't know that. I didn't know that uh, uh, on on his way home, um, his his body was was uh, laid in a state here in this room, and uh, you know, I just I just feel as I sit here and I participate in this program with you. Again, I feel very strongly that this constitution was written for me. I was not born here, but I am a beneficiary of the greatest document ever written in the history of mankind. Bijan, you are one of the reasons why I am so proud of America. You are an immigrant. You have come here to pursue the American dream. You are reaching it. You have reached it. And I'm just proud that, that uh, you are our American in this show. Dr. Joe Ellen, uh, your thoughts as we uh, finish our overture? You said something interesting earlier, Jim, that... About time. Is that what you meant? <laughs> um, that we were fighting for our rights as British. You were absolutely right. America did not exist 
until the Declaration of Independence. And in fact, for our first 150 years, we were 13 individual colonies, pretty well independent from Britain because an ocean separated us. And we got used to being independent and doing things our own way. And the British pretty well neglected us until they started to tax us and to impose more and more regulations on us, largely because they needed money to pay for foreign wars. And that's when we began to rebel because they were taxing us and we were not represented in the British Parliament. Now that's a whole other story. There's a great story behind that. When they passed the Stamp Act in 1765, the colonies exploded. Um, they burned an effigy and they tore down things. I mean, they rioted in the streets. And the British couldn't understand that. And Benjamin Franklin was living, living in London, representing several of the states. And they brought Ben Franklin, who was very well respected and well liked in all of Europe, not just England. They brought him before Parliament and ex explained to us why you people are so upset. We've taxed you before. We've done. We've regulated you before. You haven't exploded like this. What's the problem? So Ben Franklin spent an hour answering their questions. In fact, Edmund Burke said it was like watching um, the children ask questions of the schoolmaster because Franklin was so, um, he was so eloquent and so smart. And at one point he said, um, he said, we're fighting for our rights as Englishmen. Englishmen going back to the Magna Carta have a right to be represented in their government and we are not represented. And they asked him, they said, where did you get that idea? And he said, one, from Magna Carta itself, we're British, that's our history. And secondly, from the charters that created these colonies. And if you read the charter of the first colony of Virginia, Jamestown, right in that charter, and in some of the charters following that, it said that these colonists, they founded a colony, whether or not they ever came back to England, they and their children and their heirs, their children's children, would be British with all the rights and responsibilities of British citizens. So he put it right back to them. He said, we're English and we're claiming our rights. And when they didn't give us our rights, we said, okay, we're not English anymore. We became Americans on July 2nd, not the 4th, July 2nd of 1776. But we had a friend in that British parliament. His name was um, Lord Chatham. And I'm not related to him, but I wish I were. We have the same name. He was the former prime minister of England who had gotten them through the, uh, the French and Indian War here. And it was the Seven Year Wars in England. He was one of the most revered statesmen in England. He was older now, semi-retired. But he and his son, William Pitt, who became the youngest prime minister of England at the age of 24, were both on the side of the Americans. And in an eloquent speech before the parliament, Lord Chatham stood up and said, don't do this to the Americans. Remember, the Americans are the children, not the bastards of England. They didn't take his advice, so today we're Americans. Well, thank you, folks. I mean, there you have it. This is just kind of a taste of where we're going. Uh, we care. It's interesting. I'm learning from Bijan. I'm learning from Joe Ellen, and they can learn at least a little bit from me on occasion. But but so we are not good. perfect. We've never been perfect, but we are the only country really ever founded on an idea, on a concept mm -hmm. of liberty. And that's where we're, we're going to explore it. I am proud of my country for all of its defects, but I think we're better today than we were yesterday. We're going to be better tomorrow tomorrow for our children than we were today. So I'm going to end this session. Uh, we're going to each be moderators on different sessions as we go. The next one will be Dr. Joe Ellen, but I'm going to give you a quote from Thomas Jefferson, which is, if we are to guard against ignorance and remain free, it is the responsibility of every American to be informed. We're trying to get informed together. Join us, spread the word to your friends, your children, uh, others about our becoming America America is truly a perfect idea. The United States of America, as we know, is a work in progress. Help us make it better. Thank you. Join us again next week. And uh, as I say when I end most of my interviews, life is good. Why do I say that? Because it is. <laughs>